CIA head and White House Chief of Staff sees this moment. And it's Friday. Mark Shields and David Brooks weigh in on this uncertain time so close to the American election. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... Economy for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S. based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. Financial services firm, Raymond James. Johnson and Johnson. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, fostering informed and engaged communities. More at kf.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And friends of the news hour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. President Trump is being taken to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland tonight after testing positive for the coronavirus overnight. White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany said that he is experiencing, quote, mild symptoms and was to be airlifted to the military hospital, she says, out of an abundance of caution. There are reports tonight that the president's symptoms include a low gray fever, fatigue, nasal congestion, and cough. McEnany said he is expected to stay at Walter Reed for several days and will work from the hospital's presidential suite. Word of his positive test raised more questions than it answered and brought much uncertainty to the state of the presidential campaign and beyond. Our White House correspondent, Yamiche Alcindor, begins our coverage. The global pandemic hitting home at the White House. President Trump now infected with the very virus he's been fighting to contain while at the same time downplaying. Today in a tweet at 12.54 a.m., the president announced that he and First Lady Melania Trump tested positive for the coronavirus. He wrote, quote, we will begin our quarantine and recovery process immediately. In the meantime, the White House scrambled to do contact tracing and officials there expressed optimism. The chief of staff, Mark Meadows. And the American people uh, can rest assured that uh, we have a president that uh, is not only on the job, will remain on the job, and uh, I'm optimistic that uh, he'll have a very quick and speedy recovery. He has mild symptoms. Uh, as we, we look at that, the, uh, the doctor will continue to uh, uh, provide uh, expertise. And White House Press right Secretary Kayleigh McEnany spoke on Fox News hospital. this afternoon. Yeah, so he's having mild symptoms, but he's feeling good. Uh, he's in good spirits. I spoke to him last night, um, and he uh, absolutely was hard at work. But that revelation comes hours after news broke that Hope Hicks, a close Trump advisor who traveled with the president this week, had the virus. That sparked immediate concern of exposure among the president's inner circle and Washington's top officials. This morning, Vice President Pence and his wife Karen announced they tested negative. Pence's doctor said he does not need to quarantine. The Health and Human Services Secretary, Alex Azar, who testified before Congress today on political interference and the U.S.'s COVID response, also tested negative. But news broke this morning that Republican National Committee Chairwoman Rona McDaniel tested positive on Wednesday. She was last with the president last Friday. 
Meanwhile, the Democratic presidential nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, tested negative for the virus. He said in a tweet that he, quote, will continue to pray for the health and safety of the president. The president's infection upends an already unprecedented campaign. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. Put a mask on, you know, when I think I need it. The president has long downplayed the virus and cast doubt on the necessity of social distancing and facial coverings. That's a little bit like the flu. It's a little like the regular flu that we have flu shots for. And we'll essentially have a flu shot for this in a fairly quick manner. And back in March, he told journalist Bob Woodward in a phone interview that he intentionally downplayed the virus's severity. I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. At the presidential debate this week, he claimed his large campaign rallies aren't risky events. Critics quickly pointed out that former GOP presidential candidate Herman Cain died of coronavirus after attending one of the president's indoor rallies in Oklahoma. At a charity dinner before his positive test result last night, the president was optimistic that the pandemic would soon end. The end of the pandemic is in sight. Meanwhile, hospitalizations have hit their highest level since May in at least nine states across the U.S. National cases have surpassed 7.2 million. This morning, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she hopes President Trump's positive test result is a turning point in his attitude toward the virus. This is tragic. It's very sad. But it also is something that, that uh, again, uh, going into crowds, uh, unmasked and all the rest, was sort of a, a, a brazen invitation for something like this to happen. It's sad that it did, uh, but nonetheless hopeful uh, that it will be a transition to a saner approach to what this virus is all about. Uh, President America Sarika, Donald Trump. Today, global markets quickly fumbled as news of the president's infection broke around the world. President Trump is not the first head of state to test positive for the virus. Among them, the UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro. World leaders sent the president their well wishes. Russian President Vladimir Putin wrote in a memo that he is sending sincere support to President Trump. But some struck a more critical tone. French president spokesman Gabriel Attal said the president's infection is a sign that the virus spares no one, including those who are most skeptical about its reality and gravity. Uh, Yamish, the president is now at Walter Reed Hospital. How did we get here and what more do we know about the president's health tonight? Well, Stephanie, this is a remarkable moment, and it can't be said enough that the president is really dealing with a historic part of his presidency. The president is arguably the most protected American in this country, and he could not protect himself from the coronavirus. He couldn't protect the First Lady or the White House, of course, the headquarters of the federal government of the United States. Um, this is a president, the White House says, that has been moved out of an abundance of caution to Walter Reed. They, the White House and, and White House officials continue to stress that he is experiencing mild symptoms. And as we noted, those symptoms include nasal congestion, a low-grade fever, as well as fatigue. He did release a video showing and saying that he is feeling like he's in good spirits. Um, the White House doctor also says that he has a treatment that he has given the, the, the president. It's a single infusion of an experimental antibody cocktail um, aiming to help the president with his symptoms. The president is also, the White House doctor says, continuing to take vitamin B, zinc, as well as daily aspirin. Um, looking for how we got here and, and really how this happened to President Trump, you really have to look at the calendar of events and his extensive travel that he had leading up to this. So if we can put up for people this graphic, the president had four rallies between now and last Thursday. Last Thursday, September 24th, there was a rally in Jacksonville, Florida. A few days following that, there were rallies in Virginia as well as Pennsylvania. Last Saturday on September 26th, that's when you saw that Rose Garden event where he announced that he was going to be nominating Justice Judge, rather, Amy Coney Barrett, announcing her nomination in a, in a pretty packed crowd where a lot of people were not wearing masks, having been there myself. Then he traveled to Cleveland, Ohio, for the presidential debate on Tuesday. This is where things get really critical and you have to pay close attention. The president, along with his family and Hope Hicks, traveled to, Penn, to Minnesota. Hope Hicks was then diagnosed with the coronavirus on Wednesday night. After she was diagnosed, the next day, the president, knowing that Hope Hicks had been diagnosed, went to Bedminster, New Jersey, for a fundraiser and overnight, over Thursday night, um, he was diagnosed himself 
with being positive for the coronavirus. So what this all means is that the what president was traveling when he know when he knew that he was in close contact with someone who had the virus. I pressed the White House to ask how did the president make that decision? Why was it seen as okay for him to make that trip? They said that White House operations authorized the president to do that. Another big question, of course, is can the president keep working during this coronavirus issue that he's having and, and this infection that he's now fighting? The White House insists that he is continuing to be in command. There is no change of leadership here at the U.S. government. They are saying that the president will be able to work from Walter Reed. He's going to be in a presidential suite that has offices. They were also saying that he was working throughout the day at the White House. Um, that being said, his calendar was cleared all day. So from what we understand, we're not sure what the president was doing, other than, of course, making calls and talking to people. Another thing to note, the Trump campaign says that they are postponing all events going forward and that any sort of events that might be happening will be virtual. So that is the president's diagnosis, his treatment, as well as the way forward tonight. But so many potential exposures based on that calendar. So many people have reason to worry, and so many people are worried about the president tonight. Um, but a lot of people have also pointed out here um, someone called to social. That's right. And what we saw was that the president here um, in the White House, they were not always adhering to the health guidelines for their own government. The Trump administration has a specific set of guidelines. They tell people to social distance, to wash their hands, to wear masks. But what we saw in the White House time and time again was White House officials walking around holding events, not having the masks on. Now tonight and today, the National Security Council, they released a statement saying that their employees will have to now be mandated to wear masks. But what we saw was the White House having these different events. You saw the announcement of Judge Barrett as the president's nominee. I was at that event, I can tell you with my own two eyes, I saw so many people not wearing masks, standing close together. The president also, of course, had the Republican National Convention at on the lawn of the White House. Um, there were a bunch of people on the lawn, hundreds of people. Many of them were not wearing masks. So uh, critics of the president say that this was really the president not mirroring the behavior that would get the nation safely through the pandemic. And as a result, it was almost inevitable that he, as well as the White House, would become a place where the virus would be spreading to other people. And members of Congress were in the vicinity of President Trump at that event. Tonight, we have learned of a new positive test, right, Yamish? That's right. So what we have here is um, a number of members of Congress who have tested positive for the coronavirus. It's pretty remarkable. You have Mike Lee, who was at the White House on Saturday um, after that Supreme Court nomination. He was not wearing a mask. He was very close behind Mike, Vice President Mike Pence. Of course, Mike Pence has tested positive. We also have Tom Tillis. That's something, a, a new diagnosis that we found out tonight. He tested positive for the coronavirus. He was also at the White House on Saturday. There are photos of him wearing a mask. But he met with Judge Barrett on Wednesday. Mike Lee, who also is now quarantining, he met with the justice or the, the soon to be justice, wanting to be justice um, Barrett on Tuesday. So what you see is Republican officials testing positive and also being in close proximity to the Republican um, nominee for the Supreme Court. There's so much to keep track of. Again, Vice President Pence, of course, testing negative, but that new test tonight, Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina testing positive, and he is also a member of the Judiciary Committee, which is key, as we all know. Yamiche Alcinder with the latest from Washington. Thank you. Thanks so much. There are many other questions about the president's personal health, the duration of quarantine, whom else might have been exposed in recent days. Dr. Ashish Jha is the dean of the Brown University School of Public Health, and he joins me now. Dr. Jha, so given what we've seen now, the president is about to leave the White House to go to Walter Reed, they say, for several days. You've heard, I think, what we have about uh, the president's symptoms. What does this add up to for you? Yeah, so Judy, thank you for having me on. Um, this is all, of course, very concerning for both the president and for the country. Uh, in terms of the president and his health, we don't have a lot of information. Uh, we don't. We do know he received this experimental therapy, um, but but it seems like it's moving pretty quickly. And and he was diagnosed last night, 
and he is heading to the hospital tonight. It concerns me. I don't want to overstate it. I don't have a lot of details. Obviously, none of us do about his clinical condition. Uh, but this uh, this is a concerning and, and I think worrying development. Uh, it feels like more than just an abundance of caution. But let's keep our you know let's let's pray and hope that indeed uh, he's doing okay and that he'll turn around quickly. Worrying because they went ahead and gave him this infusion of this uh, what they call polyclonal uh, antibody cocktail. Worrying because of his age, he's 74. Uh, worrying because um, we are told he's overweight uh, for his height. Uh, what what makes you worry? So it's a bit of all of those things. He is clearly high risk uh, because of his age and and his weight, uh, and we don't know much about his comorbid conditions. Um, but also worrying because it feels like he's, his clinical situation has gotten worse since yesterday. A typical course for somebody with this virus may be several days of feeling relatively okay before they start getting worse. Uh, this does feel like it's moving a little faster than usual. Again, not, not, we don't know a lot here, so I really don't want to overstate what we know and, and, and what level of worry. But uh, he is the president of the United States, and we just have to have a heightened level of concern. I have to ask you this, Dr. Jha, how much confidence do you have in the information we are getting from the White House about this? So this has been a challenge out of this White House. And one of the reasons why it's so important for uh, political leaders and for the White House to build credibility with the American people is exactly for moments like this. In a moment of crisis, we need to trust what's coming from there. And we haven't always gotten straight information. So I am worried. My hope is that in this moment of crisis, the White House does level with the American people, is transparent, and shares information. Uh, but we'll have to see what comes out of the White House in terms of what's going on. And, and I will just repeat what I said a moment ago in talking with Yamish and Lisa, and that is the picture the White House is allowed. Normally, they allow the press to uh, take pictures, a video of the president uh, leaving the, the White House and getting under the helicopter. So far this evening, those, they're not allowing that picture. Uh, we're continuing to watch to see if that changes. But Dr. Zhao, we know the president has been traveling a lot. We just heard uh, Yamish report on his schedule for the last few weeks, visiting different states, holding these rallies, very little mask wearing, very little social distancing. How much could all that have contributed? Yeah, so there are two sets of issues in my mind. First of all, it's very clear that the White House has not been doing an adequate job of protecting the president, and the results of that are now in front of us. Uh, the idea that people could go up and, and be next to him without wearing a mask, that people weren't doing social distancing, all of those really put the president at risk. And the fact that that was allowed and, and maybe even in some ways encouraged uh, really strikes me as, as very problematic. Uh, but here we are, and now the big challenge in front of us is to figure out who has been in contact with the president, with the first lady, with Ms. Hicks, and try to identify who needs to be quarantined, uh, who needs to be tested. And given his schedule, we're probably talking about dozens, but more likely hundreds of people. So there is a very large uh, effort in front of us in terms of tracking everybody down and, and figuring out what to do with them. And what, what would you say, Dr. Zha, about, about Joe Biden at this point? He was uh, in Michigan today. He flew there uh, from Delaware. He did an event. He was wearing a mask. We've, we've just seen him within the last few hours. Um, is it a good idea for him to be out on the road, even staying socially distanced, wearing a mask? Yeah, so, uh, you know, another concerning part of this, I think uh, we don't know exactly when the president was uh, infected. But it is reasonable to guess that the president was likely infectious on Tuesday night during the night of the debate. Um, now, Mr. Biden would not count as an official contact because they didn't get within six feet, but they did share a stage for 90 minutes. Uh, so clearly, the vice president uh, is at some risk. It's been good to hear that he's tested negative. My sense is that's got to continue. He's got to continue getting daily tests. Uh, if he continues to be negative into early next week, I will feel better. Uh, but I think uh, Mr. Biden really does need to be extra careful at this moment uh, because he has been around somebody who was infected and infectious. Dr. Ashish Jha, thank you very much. And I want to add that I am told right now that uh, there are uh, video pictures being permitted at the White House right now 
uh, for the press uh, to see the president leaving the residence. I'm told he's walking from the residence to the White House, uh, to the helicopter. And we will uh, attempt to bring those pictures, of course, to our audience as soon as we have them. Dr. Zhao, thank you very much. And now for a look at how the president's diagnosis affects the executive branch, what it means for the country's national security. We're joined by Leon Panetta. He served as the White House chief of staff to President Clinton and then director of the CIA and director, or rather, secretary of defense in the Obama administration. Um, Leon Panetta, what does this moment mean for the country? Well, it's a, it's a serious moment uh, that uh, I think raises a lot of national security implications because uh, this involves the president of the United States uh, and whether or not he is able to fulfill uh, the duties of the presidency. Uh, and in a very dangerous world with a number of crises that uh, we're facing here at home and abroad, uh, there are concerns about uh, whether or not the United States of America uh, can, in fact, provide the governing that is necessary in order for our democracy to be able to survive in this difficult moment. Why do you say that when the White House says everything is functioning normally, um, they haven't transferred power to the vice president yet, but they say things are functioning? They're moving forward. What gives you concern? I think the, the concern is that uh, there are some important steps that need to be taken here. First of all, uh, is the president able to fulfill the duties of the presidency? Uh, and if he's now being moved uh, to a hospital, uh, is he able to complete those duties? Uh, is the chief of staff and the vice president uh, in a position where they can implement their responsibilities. Secondly, uh, are they presenting to the public full information about the situation with the president? I think this is a particularly serious time when the public needs to know what is the status of the president and how are they dealing with the concerns that we have about uh, his health. Thirdly, uh, are they are they fulfilling uh, the job of uh, of doing the business of the nation? Uh, the issues related to COVID, the issues related to stimulus, the issues related to our economy, uh, are they continuing to deal with those issues? All of that, I think, is in question right now. Well, let me ask you about national security. I mean, what are the exact concerns? Is this a moment, um, and I don't want to go beyond, you know, we're all speculating at this point, to what extent is it a concern that uh, a foreign government, um, a bad actor, international actor, could take advantage of the situation? Well, we always have great concern about whether or not uh, our adversaries are acting to undermine uh, the strength of our democracy. We know what the Russians are doing in terms of trying to undermine our election process. Uh, we know that China uh, is doing the same thing. We know that Iran and North Korea uh, have conducted uh, those kinds of operations as well. So the United States is at a very vulnerable moment. Uh, talked about uh, dealing with the, the pandemic, talked about dealing with uh, an economic recession, uh, talked about the situation and trying to make sure that we have an election process that is fair and that doesn't involve violence of some sort. Uh, all of these issues are at play right now. And adversaries now see a president who is ill from uh, the pandemic. Uh, they, they are going to be tempted to take advantage of that situation. And that's why it's critical that our national security team uh, be on alert, because this is a moment where our national security is at risk. What steps should the White House be taking right now to reassure the American people? I think the most important thing, frankly, is that uh, the vice president or the chief of staff uh, have to speak to the American people about uh, the steps that they're taking to assure that uh, this country uh, is being governed uh, and that the duties of the presidency are being fulfilled. Uh, 
a lot of questions right now, obviously, about what's taking place, what kind of health problems uh, does the president face. Uh, I think the key to trying to deal with the situation is an honest presentation to the American people about what is happening. Number one, the duties of the presidency are being fulfilled. We are taking every step to make sure that's happening. Number two, this is the situation with regards to his health, and be very honest in presenting that situation to the American people, that it's under control and that we are dealing with it. And thirdly, we are going to continue to deal with the business of the nation. We're continuing to negotiate on a stimulus bill. We're continuing to try to deal with the COVID crisis. We're continuing to try to deal with economic issues within our country. Those are the clear signals that have to be sent to the American people in order to make clear that in this crisis, the United States of America is still being governed. And, and how confident are you, Leon Panetta, that this White House will be direct and will be transparent on, that, on these uh, points that you say are absolutely essential? Well, the record, as we all know, is not very good. Um, and uh, there's just a, there's an awful lot of distrust about uh, what comes out of the White House in terms of, uh, of the news and what they say and whether or not they are being fully honest with the American people about what's happening. There are questions about that. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, this can't be a moment where someone in the White House steps forward uh, and very directly and honestly says, this is the situation. This is what we're dealing with, uh, and we do have the situation under control. Uh, and try to restore some of that trust with the American people. But right now, the trust of the American people, uh, not only in the White House, but in the Congress and in the other institutions of our democracy, I think is at risk. Uh, and for that reason, this is a moment when you have to restore that relationship with the American people so that our democracy has confidence that our institutions of government can function. Former Defense Secretary, former White House Chief of Staff, Leon Panetta, we thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. The news of President Trump's coronavirus positive test result was quickly followed by a jobs report that was weaker than expected, the last before Election Day. The U.S. unemployment rate dropped to 7.9 percent in September, and the economy added 661,000 jobs, the smallest monthly gain since May, leading to concerns about a slowing and deeply uneven recovery. So far, the economy has added back about half of the 22 million jobs that were lost after the pandemic first hit. But millions of people are struggling mightily and running out of federal assistance in some cases. Amna Nawaz has more on all of that, but let's begin with some voices from around the country. My name is Ben. I'm from Indiana, and I was a senior manufacturing engineer. Latanya Darasaw, New York, um, and I was a copywriter at a tech and entertainment company. My name is Heather Williams. Prior to the pandemic, I was a adjunct philosophy instructor and graduate assistant. My name is Sheila Richardson, and I was a learning specialist. I lost my job because the company said that they did away with the position. It decreased my finances about 30%. So it's a big gap, a major gap. The assumption was that, you know, we all would be brought back, yeah, once we got, you know, ahead of COVID. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. My weekly amount that I get from unemployment now pretty much just covers my rent. We had a, a nice savings with a 401k, IRA, savings accounts, whatever. I thought, you know, we were in pretty decent middle America shape, but now they're all just, and you can just see it month by month, just boom, 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 just going down. I've had to cut back on my prescriptions. I've had to reduce um, groceries or any sort of pleasures in groceries like ice cream, unless it's on sale. Maybe I'll take all of my medicine today and some of my medicine tomorrow. Do I uh, keep eating ramen even though I'm a heart patient and I know this is bad for me because it's all I can afford? Um, do I pay my electric bill or do I pay my rent? 
those are the decisions that we've have, had to be making. I didn't plan for this. So like, I don't know what, you know, what the next steps are for me. And then again, just when the bills are piling up and you have rent due at the first of the month, it's, yeah, so it's, it's difficult. I had a healthy salary when I was laid off. A lot of people would prefer to, to start fresh with like a recent college graduate, someone with a, maybe a year to three years experience. So that's another, that's a kind of hit against me, I guess. I'm a disabled person who wor has worked two jobs just to be able to uh, make ends meet. And uh, my partner works 60 hours a week and that is not enough to support us. There has been nothing done. I applied a month ago for benefits and I've received nothing. I graduated um, into the recession in 2008. So this feels exactly like that. And, you know, unfortunately during that time, it took me three years to find a job and that's with a degree, with experience. I have enough savings to carry me through the end of the year, but if I don't see that happening, then I will definitely probably have to move back home. It's hard to even think about the long term when you're so focused on the right here and right now. We're focused on this week. Do we have groceries this week? Unemployment benefits for me run out in, in November. That's literally in a month. It caused me to have depression, to feel very sad, very weighted down. And the outlook is where do you go from here? For a closer look at the latest numbers and to get a sense of who's being hit hardest by the recession, I'm joined by Heather Long of The Washington Post. Heather, welcome back to the News Hour and thanks for being with us. We know recessions usually hit the most vulnerable among us the hardest. When you look back over the last seven months, big picture, what does your analysis show about who is being hit hardest right now? So we're basically half recovered and that's good to see some jobs coming back. But what's really different about this crisis is, of course, the coronavirus, and it has so deeply impacted low-wage workers. We can all see it as we drive around our communities, restaurants still operating at half capacity, a lot of stores still closed, bars still closed. And what we found as we really dug into the numbers is how deeply unequal this is. Low-wage workers are basically in a depression-like state. They've been hit eight times harder than high-wage workers. Um, basically, the recession is over for people at the top while the working class is still in a depression. And if you look at it by race, for instance, black men and women, their jobs have come back about 34 percent compared to whites who are 60 percent back or Americans with college degrees who are 55 percent back versus those who don't have college degrees who are more likely to be in those service jobs are only about 40 percent back. So it's deep disparities right now. Heather, your analysis found a massive discrepancy when you look at age groups at well as well. Take a look at this graphic here. This shows all the different employment by age group. Those top lines are Americans age 25 and older, but that bottom line there is young Americans. That's Americans between the ages of 20 and 24. How hard were they hit? Uh, extremely hard. You can see it in the graph. Uh, those people who are trying to get those jobs often in restaurants and hotels just get their toehold into the labor market. And those jobs were just completely blown away in the spring and have been slow to come back. The other group that's really been a big discrepancy is moms versus dads with schools and daycares closed and all these virtual classes. The burden is falling on mothers. Uh, mothers of school aged children are only about 45% of jobs recovered versus dads of kids in school are 70% recovered. Massive difference there. And in September, we saw a huge dropout. Over 800,000 women just quit their jobs entirely and left the labor force. And that's a very alarming sign. Heather, in just a few seconds we have left, we cannot stress enough just how much the disparity of this recession is apparent when you look across income levels, especially compared to recessions of past years, when you look at the recessions of 1990, 2001, and 2008. This current recession has a massive disparity. The top line you see on the graph there, the highest earning quarter of Americans, the bottom line there, the lowest earning Americans. What does recovery look like for them? 
I'm extremely worried about it, particularly if Congress and the White House do not pass more aid soon. You saw, you just heard those vignettes. I hear it too. People are eating ramen noodles. They're having to decide between buying prescription drugs or paying rent. And I think of uh, Natasha Smith, a woman I talked to in Louisiana who lost her job at a casino. I said, what are you eating for dinner tonight? She opened her refrigerator and she said, I've only got two things here, one packet of wings and one packet of thighs and we don't have anything else. Devastating stories from across America. That is Heather Long of The Washington Post joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Sy with NewsHour West. We'll return to Judy Woodruff and the rest of the program after these headlines. In light of the president and other lawmakers testing positive for coronavirus, the upcoming Senate Judiciary Committee hearing to confirm Amy Coney Barrett may not take place entirely in person. Committee Chair Lindsey Graham said tonight any senator who wants to participate virtually will be allowed to do so. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer tweeted this evening that it would be irresponsible and and dangerous to move forward with a hearing. September's unemployment report, coupled with news the president has contracted the COVID virus, pushed stocks lower on Wall Street today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 134 points to close below 27,683. The Nasdaq fell 251 points and the S&P 500 slipped 32. Firefighters in Northern California faced dry and windy conditions today as they battled a wildfire burning out of control in wine country. The so-called glass fire north of San Francisco has scorched nearly 600 buildings. 80,000 people are under evacuation orders, but officials said they do expect better weather soon. We're uh, looking forward to decreased winds, decreased temperatures, increased humidities, which will give our firefighters and our boots on the ground a uh, fighting chance to gain additional perimeter control and start to bring some normalcy back to these impacted areas and get uh, people back home where they belong. Wildfires burning in California this year have charred almost 4 million acres, a new milestone in the state's worst fire season on record. Hours of Kentucky grand jury recordings in the case over the killing of Breonna Taylor were made public today. In the tapes, Louisville police said they identified themselves before bursting into Taylor's apartment and fatally shooting her while serving a drug warrant. They said they returned fire after one officer was shot in the leg. Taylor's boyfriend said he used his legal firearm because he did not hear them and thought an intruder was breaking in. The jury did not charge the officers with Taylor's death. A federal judge in California has ordered the Trump administration to continue collecting census data through the end of the month, as scheduled. The judge says it is meant to ensure that the most vulnerable and underrepresented communities will not be disadvantaged. It reversed Monday's announcement from Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross that the nation's headcount would end October 5th. The Treasury Department imposed sanctions on eight Belarusian officials today for their roles in the country's disputed presidential election and the violent crackdown on protests that followed. The move came after the European Union took similar measures. Neither the U.S. or EU sanctioned the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, who has denied the election was rigged. Guatemala's president today warned his country will detain and return members of a migrant caravan that set out from Honduras for the U.S. He said the roughly 2,000 migrants were a health risk amid the pandemic. The caravan crossed into the country Thursday and rushed through the border without registering. One migrant died trying to climb onto a moving flatbed trailer. And back in this country, newly released audio recordings from 2018 show First Lady Melania Trump frustrated by how the media portrayed her response to the administration's family separation policy. The conversation, conversations were secretly taped by Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, a former aide who wrote a book titled Melania and Me. In the audio released on CNN last night, the First Lady also aired frustrations about having to plan the White House Christmas decorations. He say I'm, I'm complicit. I'm the same like him. I support him. I don't no. say enough. I don't do enough. Yeah. I say that I'm working on Christmas, uh, planning for the Christmas. And they said, oh, what about the children that they were separated? Give me a 
home break, I was trying to get the, the kid reunited with the mom. I, w- I didn't have a chance. Needs to go through the process and through the law. Today's chief of staff accused Walkoff of secretly recording the first lady to, quote, peddle herself and her salacious book. Still to come on the news hour with Judy Woodruff, Shields and Brooks clarify this moment in American history. And we remember some of the lives lost in this pandemic. This is the PBS News Hour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. The president has tested positive for COVID, as we've been reporting. Millions of Americans are out of work. Two weeks ago at this moment, Justice Ginsburg was still alive. It is a lot to process. Thankfully, we have the analysis of Shields and Brooks, that is, syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. So hello to both of you. A lot has happened just in the last 24, 12 hours even. David, first of all, your reaction to this fast-moving news that the president not only has tested positive, but he's now at Walter Reed Hospital. Yeah, I was unnerved. I happened to be awake at 1 a.m. And when I saw the tweet that he was infected, and, you know, we take umbrage at things he does, but I think the whole country was shocked and unnerved and saddened that that he drew ill. And I looked at my Twitter feed, and people on the left, uh, Chris Hayes, an MSNBC host, said he was praying for him, and people on the right were, obviously. <clears throat> and so he's a man. He's our president. Uh, and we need him to be healthy. Uh, and so, you know, just a few minutes ago on East Coast time, as we're talking, uh, the White House released an 18-second video of, of Trump talking the video, thanking people for their expressions of support. They released, they saw the video of him walking to the Marine One, the helicopter, on the way to Walter Reed. And it's comforting. It's comforting to see uh, him in reasonably good shape. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're humans. And this has been such an emotionally exhausting year. And the accumulation of emotional trauma is just, mm. we've got one more, one more episode. You know, I was thinking, man, October, it seems like it'll never end. And I realize it's October 2nd, you know. So a lot, it's been, it's just an emotional gripping year. It's been a whirlwind of um, uh, the likes of which I don't think any of us has seen. We've been looking at this video, listening to David, but looking at this video of President Trump walking from the White House uh, to get on Marine One, the helicopter. And Mark, before I turn to you, we do have that 18-second message the president tweeted a moment ago. Let's listen to that. Watch it. I want to thank everybody for the tremendous support. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will never forget it. Thank you. So, Mark, uh, the president there um, speaking clearly. We, uh, he, he looked like himself, but we are told that uh, he's experienced fatigue, uh, perhaps some temperature, uh, other symptoms. He's already received an infusion of a special, uh, what they call cocktail, uh, anti, of antibodies. Um, but it is a moment, a, a sobering moment. Sobering moment indeed, Judy. And uh, it changes the political landscape of 2020 quite like uh, uh, no other event. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's that's uh, the reality. Uh, they, I think Joe Biden spoke for uh, mo- virtually all Americans when he said that both the president and the first lady are in his and Joe Biden's thoughts and prayers. Um, and I, I think that's universal. Uh, but one can't escape the reality of the politics. Um, the, the coronavirus is the election issue of 2020. It always has been, and it now returns center stage. Um, and uh, it is exactly the issue that the president did not want. He uh, did not want the disease, per- obviously, personally, uh, but uh, th- he does not want this issue to dominate our politics. Um, and I don't think there's any way from here on in, that you escape that. Given what's going on, David, and clearly it's early, we don't know the course of the president's um, uh, treatment, uh, how he will do, how serious uh, this uh, case will be for him. 
But what does it look like it could be the effect on the, on the campaign? Yeah, I, there was some thought uh, that there would be some sympathy of people would rally around him, as happened to Boris Johnson when he got COVID very early in, in the pandemic. Uh, I think that's possible, but probably unlikely. I think it's unlikely because they, he made such a point of doing behavior that was risky. And at this moment, in particular, it looks cavalier, and especially for a president who has a public role to perform, uh, it looks like not the best version of public service. So I, I think people will will say, you know, he, he just didn't take this seriously. You know, he, he was out there at that Amy Coney Barrett event, and people were hugging each other, and nobody was wearing masks, and we've seen that throughout the year. It also means he won't be campaigning for a little while. We don't know how long the recovery will last. It also means that um, there probably won't be a second debate. Uh, it also means that, as Mark said, COVID is, is once again at the top of everybody's mind. So just in speaking in political terms, it's, I would say, very bad news for the Trump campaign. Mark, how do you see the effect on, uh, on the election, on the campaign? Well, I, I think, Judy, uh, let's be very blunt. Uh, th there is no Donald Trump campaign. Donald Trump is the Donald Trump campaign. It is uh, his, uh, his tweets, his rallies, uh, his uh, off-the-cuff, uh, uh, frequently given press comments. Uh, that, that is what has driven the narrative. And his narrative has been uh, that uh, I am the president of unmatched peace and prosperity. Uh, it was a country that, under his uh, administration that reached its lowest unemployment rate in 51 years, um, that he was reaching out to better relations with North Korea and for a while a rapport with China. Um, all of that is all of that has changed, um, and uh, it's a it, it's a, a different different campaign. Uh, and uh, it, it's he tried changing the subject, whether it was to the fraudulent mail voting uh, or to whatever subject came to mind. Uh, as long as it wasn't coronavirus, and coronavirus now is is central, dominant, and inescapable. And, David, this comes just a few days after the debate, the first debate, or we assume we don't know whether there will be more, but a debate in which Donald Trump more than dominated. He uh, um, overwhelmed uh, that e Tuesday evening. Um, it, it, did it have an effect, do you think, on, on voters who still don't know what they're going to do in no on November 3rd? It certainly did in my circles. Uh, even among Trump supporters uh, who are friends, they were devastated and shocked. Um, some of them don't, are not on Twitter. They don't see a lot of that Twitter stuff, and suddenly they see this. I think it was one of the most uh, important events of the campaign for this reason. People like me can sermonize about how, when you, ba you behave badly, when you destroy every norm of civility and decency, you corrode the world around you. You destroy the norms of standard behavior. The problem with pe when people like me sermonize about this is it's an invisible process, and it's a slow corrosion. On debate night, the American people got to see in real time with their own eyes the way one man destroyed an American political institution, the presidential debate. And so that's just a clear example of the centrality of character and the centrality of decency and how what we saw when you have bad character, frankly, and indecency, it has the explosive force of a howitzer. It just breaks things and makes people suffer. And that process, in my view, has been going on throughout the Trump presidency. But here it happened in real time right in front of everybody's eyes. So I, I, I think it's an extremely significant event in the whole arc of the Trump presidency. Mark, how much harm do you think that the debate did to the president's political fortunes uh, and to the country? I, I think it was obviously, it was obviously his missed opportunity, Judy. Uh, his, his opportunity uh, was to try and make the race into a referendum. Uh, 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 rather, a choice between himself and Joe Biden. He, he brought all the attention, all the focus back to himself, made it a referendum on himself again. He was in, interrupted by one count, Joe Biden, 120 times. He did. David's absolutely right. He took an institution which had been a rather remarkable civic institution, criticized uh, by some for not being sparkly enough or whatever else, but it had been a remarkable moment where in every campaign where 90 minutes, uh, both candidates stood there and defended and explained and answered questions and were held accountable. Uh, and we found out what sense they were. 
it, it was it was more than a travesty. Um, it was it was a a moment at which he brought all attention back to himself. Um, he mocked Joe Biden on the wearing a mask, uh, which seems uh, sadly ironic uh, uh, and uh, and poignant at, at this point. Uh, but I, I I don't think there's any question uh, that the two major events, the bookend events uh, of this campaign. Now, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but really happened this week. And they were the debate and the disease. Right. Um, and I think that uh, both of them. And in the final analysis, Judy, there have been four presidents reelected since Ronald Reagan. And, and in each case, every one of them, it, by measurement of the Wall Street Journal NBC poll, was personally liked. Donald, uh, Donald Trump is the only American president seeking reelection who is personally unliked by 70 percent of his fellow Americans. There was nothing that he did Tuesday night in Cleveland that made him more likable to those Americans whose votes he needs. Uh, David, only about 30, 40 seconds left. But in that time, how is Joe Biden doing in this campaign? He's done a masterful job of holding his coalition together. I did not think he did particularly well in the debate. I thought his impromptu remarks were good, but his scripted remarks explaining health care were chaotic. So uh, I think he's done a, a very good job of not being Donald Trump, but he needs to work on a little of his performance, I'd say. And and today, his his message uh, to the country about the president? Okay. I'm told <laughs> we need to go, and so I'm going to thank both of you. David Brooks, Mark Shields, thank you. As we monitor the president's health and we hope for a full and quick recovery, we also remember the thousands of men and women across this country who've passed away from the virus. Here are a few of them. Larry Kelly taught American government to high school seniors in Miami for 32 years. When they turned 18, he made sure every student registered to vote. A lover of books and learning, Larry never wanted to leave the classroom. He taught summer school and led field trips to the courthouse in Washington, D.C. When he eventually retired, the 78-year-old worked at the local library. Quiet but witty and hilarious to those who knew him best, Larry loved cheering on his home teams in New Orleans with his daughters and granddaughters. Nursing was more than a job for 62-year-old Patricia Edwards. She wore old-fashioned scrubs to the intensive care unit in Greenville, South Carolina, where she worked. Nurse Pat was one of the first in line to treat COVID patients. She was fearless, even when battling cancer herself, and made those around her feel safe, her daughter said. Thanksgiving was Pat's favorite holiday. She spent the day in the kitchen, blasting old-school R&B with her five children and 13 grandchildren. John E. Thrower, Jr. had a megawatt smile. A bus driver in Richmond, Virginia, John was a dedicated worker who loved talking to his passengers, his wife said. Always jolly and busy, John also had a passion for cooking, a skill he learned from his mom. He was spiritual, too, a loving father and grandfather who enjoyed traveling with his wife. John was 49 years old. A teacher and school counselor, Dr. Betty Jean McBride's favorite piece of advice to her students was bloom wherever you are planted. Heartfelt and giving, the 71-year-old spent much of her time helping others. She founded a local group called 100 Women on the Move to give back to women in need. She met her husband on the board of the Columbus, Georgia YMCA and raised his son as her own. Growing up in El Salvador, Jose Mardoqueo Reyes was fascinated by radio. He went on to become a radio show host in Washington, D.C., where he combined his love for broadcast and sports. Jose often announced local games for his Spanish-speaking listeners. His daughter described Jose's personality as infectious, straightforward, and funny. A beloved husband, father to five, and grandfather Jose was 54 years old. 
We want to thank the family members who share those wonderful stories with us. Our hearts go out to you and to all those who've lost loved ones in this pandemic. And of course, our wishes are with the president and the first lady for their health as well. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Thank you for joining us. Please have a safe weekend. Good night. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, a dedicated advisor can tailor advice and recommendations to your life. That's Fidelity Wealth Management. Consumer Cellular. Johnson and Johnson. Financial services firm Raymond James. BNSF Railway. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. For more than 50 years, advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world. At Hewlett.org. Supporting social entrepreneurs and their solutions to the world's most pressing problems. SchoolFoundation.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And friends of the News Hour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.